Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Village Green. Thank you for joining us, whether that is here in person or online. Um, we have a great service for you this morning, so we are excited to worship with you. Would you stand and sing as we worship our God together? morning, Village Green Community Church and all of those who have joined us online. Welcome to this morning's service. Really glad that you are here. 
to partake in this. My name is Richard. I'm one of the volunteers here at Village Green as part of our strategic communication team. And I uh, just want to start off with welcome. There we go. That was a test to see if you're awake yet. <laughs> now that I can have your attention, we will continue on and I'll let you know about what's going on here this uh, coming up time frame uh, here at Village Green because it's a very busy place. Soup Sunday is next Sunday. Please sign up in the foyer if you plan to bring a soup and also if you plan on attending so we can have numbers and all that sort of stuff. We will need help rearranging this room here next week uh, to set up for it and then also return it back to the, the way it is now. So please be aware of that for next week. Um, coming up this summer, we've got Village Green is hosting the Adullam Camps Music Day Camp. And this is for everyone in the grades who will be entering into grades four to eight this fall, September of 2024. And this is open for whether or not you have musical talents and experience or not. Okay, that's not a prerequisite. This is your chance to grow your musical skills from wherever they are. It is in a very easy, welcoming way. There is also a variety show, a vinyl showcasing of their music classes together. It will be presented on the last day of the camp. Also a reminder for those who haven't registered yet, the early bird pricing does end at the end of April and the calendar just keeps moving faster and faster and faster. So uh, get on that um, as quickly as you can. Also for those who need it, uh, there are subsidies available through the church. And for more information on this, you can visit the website at dullum.ca or you can contact Julianne by emailing her at youth at villagegreenchurch.com for all the details. I'd like to extend out an invitation to you to join Village Green Community Church for an amazing trip to see Daniel. This is a four-day motor coach tour at Sight and Sound Theater in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, October 7th through 10th this fall. Trip includes your transportation, tickets to see the show Daniel, admission to Longwood Gardens and Tabernacle Experience, a tour of an Amish farm, three nights accommodation plus six meals, this trip is not being organized by the church, but this information is being passed on to you to help promote it on behalf of Paulette Scheistel. So if you want more details on this, please see Paulette. That's what we have right now is the main highlights. I just want to take this opportunity now to pray for our offerings and for everything else that's going on in the church. If you bow your head with me. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for what you provide, and that's everything to us, Lord. Thank you that... No matter what we're going through, that we can rest assured and fall back into your arms and that you're always there to catch us. Dear Lord, I thank you that um, as a community church, we are so involved uh, here in our community in so many different ways. And I, I want to just take a time now to say thank you, Lord, that we are able to do that, that we are able to reach out through our benevolent funds and through all kinds of other ways and things that are going on that we can, we don't necessarily always hear about but they make a difference in people's lives. And when John talks about changing the world, it's about changing one person's world. And Lord, I thank you that we continue to do that. And Lord, as we take up our morning offerings, I want to thank you and praise you for how you have guided us as a, as a, a worship or as a, um, a leadership team and, and using these funds to be able to continue to do this work. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And as the offering is being collected, you can stand and join us as you're able, and we will continue our worship here this morning.
Let us pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you indeed for your reckless love. And for those of us that have experienced that reckless love, we acknowledge the peace that it brings into our lives. And Lord, this morning I want to pray for peace. So much of our world is in turmoil and chaos even in war. And Lord, I pray for peace today. So many lives are being affected. Children, elderly, anyone who breathes 
are being affected today. And Lord, we pray for your everlasting love and your peace to be acknowledged in the hearts of people around the world and allow this world to flourish as you intended it originally. So Lord, we pray for that peace today as we gather together, both online and in person. And we pray that you would bless us today as we gather to worship in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, time for the kids to go to Kids Connection and their particular program. All right. Um, as the kids are going, I'm going to make a couple of comments. Don't put up your hand, okay? Um, but how, how many of you... Uh, yeah, don't... Yeah. Um, we had a solar eclipse last week, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. How many of you were glad we did the book of Revelation and you didn't have to listen to all the end of the world stuff? Okay, you know, in all, in all fairness, right? Wasn't that nice that we didn't have to, we got to navigate that? You know, my favorite story out of last week was um, somebody, um, let's just say south of here, um, was in a restaurant and tipped over $1,100 to um, the servers and said, um, I'm not going to need this because I'm going to be raptured um, <laughs> tomorrow. So here, um, you know, and then came back the next day demanding the money back. Bad theology begets bad behavior. True? Okay. And, and listen, I know that's, that's a comical thing, but that's serious. That is absolutely serious, and we have to get this right. Okay? Anyway. So, yeah. Um, that's where we are. But here we are at Village Green Community Church this morning. Uh, a, a church that explores life and explores life through um, the way of Jesus. Because Jesus taught us about life, how to understand the world around us, how to gain peace, how to be uh, in relationship with, with our Heavenly Father, all that kind of stuff. So we're going to continue as we're doing the second part of a series called Hearing Jesus. And I hope we hear Jesus today. Now, I grew up at a time where it seemed like everybody had bumper stickers. Like, I don't know if those of you are, you know, my ilk. Now, some of the bumper stickers I cannot repeat today, all right? And uh, I, I think if some, some of those bumper stickers were on cars today, your tires would be slashed and your doors, like, you know, people would be really upset, okay? But I remember riding with my dad this one time, and... Uh, I read this bumper sticker that said, I break for hallucinations. <laughs> Have you ever seen that one? And I said to my dad, what, what, what does that mean? And he said, you know, my, in his typical dad way, the way I remember, he kind of smirked and leaned over and said, when you drive, you'll understand. <laughs> And I remember the first year driving, I'm going down some country road, and sure enough, there was somebody breaking and nothing in front of them. And I, I couldn't figure out what was going on. And you, know, and you know when you suddenly remember something from way long ago, and I was, ah, yeah, now I get it, okay? Now I get it. And um, I had an intern some years ago who was going into pastoral ministry, and he had a bumper sticker that said, God loves you, but I'm his favorite. <laughs> and I, yeah, and, and, and I would come out and I said, doesn't that bother, you know, aren't you kind of, you know, putting up a religious barrier in doing that? And, uh, you know, anyway, but 
I use that today to kind of illustrate one of the points, one of the really important points we're going to try and make today about religious roadblocks. All right? And we're looking at probably one of the most popular passages in the entire Bible. Most of you could probably quote this, but this is what we are going to look at today. I'm going to kind of try and unpack it a little bit differently than what you're used to because what we're going to look at is, is this person hearing Jesus and what are they hearing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So here we are in that well-known passage out of John 3, and we're going to start at verse number 1. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Now, here's, here's one thing about Nicodemus, that we know he's a Pharisee, but in that day and in that culture, we would all want to be Nicodemus. He was well-respected. He was, you know, higher echelon. He was probably wealthy. He had, you know, the kind of the community ear and a really important social position. So he would have been a highly respected person as part of that environment. And he shows a level of respect to Jesus by calling him rabbi, which is really interesting because in that environment, to be a rabbi meant years of of training and, you know, it was pretty disciplined, etc., etc. But here is Nicodemus calling Jesus rabbi without all the kind of background and credentials that anybody else of that ilk would have had. So there's this high level of respect. But what's really interesting, um, that there's a hint here of a kind of religious drift that's culturally. We're going to unpack the cultural thing that's behind this because Nicodemus says, you know, you, you come to, to, to you know, teach us, but at the same time, because of your miraculous signs, all right? Notice, I've, you know, last week we talked about the, the request for miraculous signs that the Pharisees had given, you know, asking Jesus for. And that's really important, that they've asked for miraculous signs. This is, this is culturally one of the things that they're looking for. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody today was to ask you, I want you to validate your faith or what you claim about your faith only if you could create a miraculous sign. How easy would that be for you to do? Okay? So not so much that you probably haven't experienced something that for you has been miraculous, but what does it say about the individual who's asking that question? What's the barrier that exists just because they're asking that? Secondly, during that time, there's an incredible adherence to the law, right? Do you, you know... Do you, are you faithful to, you know, the, the requirements for uh, cleanliness? Are you, you know, do you adhere to the feasts and the festivals that have to be celebrated on a weekly basis? Do you adhere to all the stipulations that the law gives you? Those are the, these two are the big priorities culturally right now. And that's the background for Nicodemus and what he is expecting as he's talking to Jesus. Here's what isn't part of the culture that we're reading when we read the Gospels. They seem to ignore character formation and those that help others. It can be seen as a weakness. Character formation, even though the Bible, the Old Testament especially, has so much about character formation. But in any culture, right, we find, you know, we're divided because they come from that part of the world. They're not, they're not one of us. They're not, they don't worship like we do. They don't adhere to things like we do. And we naturally, societally, create these boundaries and these separations and this ability to keep other people who are not like us away. And that's what happens religiously, too. That we can create this kind of religion that says, we're in and you're out. 
And we judge you by whether or not, you know, you can do miraculous things or we judge you by how you adhere to all the stipulations and all the stuff that we demand of you to do. But you slip up once, okay? That's kind of like the environment that exists for Nicodemus at this time. And Jesus' reply in, this, in the next few verses is really kind of wonderful because he kind of, he kind of you know, charges in at the point where he recognizes the cultural deficiencies that are being communicated. Jesus replies, I tell you the truth, which in the Gospel of John, if you know uh, the original Greek says, amen, amen, which is what that means. He was repeating it twice, twice, which says, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, if you're going to work for this, if you're going to be expecting miraculous things and all that kind of stuff, there's something more important and more dynamic that happens than what you think and looking for. What do you mean, says Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? What do we call that? A misunderstanding. Yeah. That's, that's a big, big misunderstanding. That's what happens here. Where Jesus is saying something that he's intending to be spiritual, and Nicodemus is taking it in a very physical sense. Okay? Remember our definition from last week about how, why Jesus uses the misunderstanding. He would sometimes communicate in a way that tested who was really listening and not only that, but what were they understanding? That should be in the next slide right there. I think I've, I've put it up just to remind you. I don't think I have it in your notes, but I just have it on the slide just to remind you that that's how we're defining misunderstanding here and why Jesus uses this. So this is the opportunity now in response to how Nicodemus has responded to Jesus, that Jesus can now have a serious conversation with a religious leader, all right? And Jesus goes on to say this, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. How many of you experienced the windstorm on, wind, on Friday night, right? Okay, could you tell where it was coming from? No, but it was pretty powerful, wasn't it? Right? We had damage just this morning on this roof ourselves, you know, coming in, all that stuff. And I'm sure many of you experienced some kind of damage on your property because of the wind, right? Okay? But this is a great illustration, right? That's the power of the Spirit of God. And, you know, there's, there's a, a phrase in this that has caused a lot of dis. Um, uh, you know, consternation, even from a scholarly standpoint, the thing you must be born of water and spirit, okay? This is, you know, this comes out of a lot of Old Testament. I'm just going to summarize it really, really quickly. But water in the Old Testament, for instance, was a, you know, designated renewal and cleansing, okay? There's a renewal and cleansing that happens spiritually when you are born again. And the spirit is the transformation of the heart. However you want to argue the word spirit, the, the reality is Jesus is talking about renewal. He's talking about cleansing. He's talking about this transformation of the heart. I've said many, many times, the most we can do humanly speaking is reform ourselves. Only the spirit of God can transform us. That's such a, you know, such a, 
important biblical principle because we think we can do it all. And this is what Jesus is challenging Nicodemus. You're a religious person. You think you can do it all. It's not about you doing it all, okay? It's about you having a relationship with God that's authentic, real, practical, is empowered by divine enablement of the Spirit of God and not you to work to have yourselves consider a right relationship with God, okay? There's a lot of danger to that. There's a lot of danger to that. Again, we're going to try and unpack it as we get further. And commentators argue about what does it mean to be born again, this Greek word anothen, about again. And there's two primary definitions in the Greek. It's to be born from above or, again, to be repeated, be born again. The reality is, don't fight over the two definitions. The reality is, both apply. If you look at the text, both apply. To be born again means to be born from above, from the power of the Holy Spirit. This is, I know, you know, kind of deep theologically, but that's the Reality. Let's continue um, with some of this uh, response from Jesus and Nicodemus. So Nicodemus says, how are these things possible? And Jesus replied, you are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things? I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? Isn't that a powerful statement? Aren't we so earthly oriented sometimes that we miss, you know, the kind of divine things that God's doing around us? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned. But the Son of Man has come down from heaven, and as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. This is a really interesting... Jesus is is brilliant in bringing in a a story from the Old Testament of the book of Numbers where poisonous snakes were were killing people and hurting people and God ordered, you know, Moses said, make a a bronze, make a snake and put it on the end of a pole and those that look at it will be healed and will not be affected by the poisonous snakes. That's what it was. Here here Jesus, and again, Jesus is talking about what's going to happen to him very soon, that he'll be lifted up that he'll be placed on a cross, he'll be crucified. And those that understand the cross properly will see it as the redemptive work of God in Christ for those who believe. Have I lost you? Okay. In fact, I'd probably say this, this week, and I'll probably say it the next time we're up, is that the whole misunderstanding that happens in the Gospel of John points to the ultimate misunderstanding, and that's the cross. That's what all of these misunderstandings in John point to, that when you finally get to the cross, those who have ears to hear, eyes to see, okay, will know what the cross truly is. And this is where where Jesus is kind of pointing Nicodemus. Now, Jesus is absolutely incredulous at this point of time. You cannot miss, like, how, how, how are you missing this, Nicodemus? You are a religious leader. In fact, you, you teach people how to enter into the kingdom of God. You teach people about obedience to God's commands, a life that's devoted to God, a life of joy and commitment to Him, all of those kinds of things. How do you miss something so, you know, so incredibly simple about 
this divine enablement about coming to faith and if you've made it just purely about your own ability, your own strength, your own kind of path to look where I am, I did it all myself. That's such a dangerous path, isn't it? And granted, Nicodemus is probably hearing it in terminology he's not 100% used to hearing, but it shouldn't be going beyond his present understanding. This shouldn't be that shocking, but Jesus is absolutely surprised at how limited his understanding is, okay? See, this is the, this is the problem with adherence to ritual, is that the ritual becomes the way to a right relationship with God. Instead of the ritual being an expression of the right relationship with God. And that's, that's kind of a, a really fine line that we can mistakenly cross and not even be aware of it. And I would argue that that's what's happened throughout the Old Testament. You watch the Old Testament really carefully. The laws, the rituals, the sacrifices, the, the ceremonial cleaning, all of that stuff became the way I make myself right with God, as opposed to it being an expression of my love for God. Okay? You don't, you know, in our present environment, we don't give to God just so we can brag on ourselves. Or say, look what I did. I have a brick on the building now that has my name on it. <laughs> okay? We do that as an expression of our relationship and our love for what God has done for us. Okay? It's a fine line. Can I just, can I honestly say it's a very fine line? And we can cross it without really recognizing it. And yet Jesus brings us up short and says, guess what? Be careful of that. Do you know, like, do you realize in the Old Testament, everyone had sacrifices? Every culture, every, every, every kind of other uh, religion that existed at that time had all kinds of temples and rituals and sacrificial systems, right? What God created in the Old Testament was unique, was, was an identifier of separating the Israelis from every other culture that sacrificed. That's why they did it in a particular way. That's why their altars weren't very fancy. They were very plain. You know, there was all kinds of things that went on there. And it was to demonstrate that we worship not a plethora of gods, not multiple gods, not the god of agriculture and the god of, you know, uh, childbearing or anything like that. We sacrifice to only one god who is creator and god of all. Period. Okay? That's, that was a whole Old Testament system. But they too, like, you know, drifted. I call it religious drift. If you've been a Christian a long time, I would, I, would, I would challenge you that at some point in your Christian walk, you've fallen into religious drift. That, you know, your relationship with Christ has kind of, you know, navigated away from this heartfelt relationship. You're probably not praying as much anymore as you used to. You're probably not reading your Bible as much because you know it all or you've done it all or I've been there. I, you know, I've, I've been in church for, you know, 100 years already. Thank you. You know, I know it all, you know, heard it all. Okay. In fact, how many of you have heard a message on this particular passage dozens of times? Don't put up your hand. Okay? Okay? But that's, that's what happens. Okay? Now, here's, 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 here's the zinger. Here's the passage that we all know instinctively. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Okay? Amen. I, I love this version because this version has done something that's, that's kind of been problematic in other versions because it understood the Greek construction here. For, 
for God so loved the world is how we normally do that. But notice that this version does, for this is how God loved the world. That's what that passage really, really, uh, you know, intimates in the Greek, is that this is a passage about you not being extra special that God died for you, even though that's an amazing truth, but this is how God loved the world. He loved the world by sending his one and only son to die, so whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That is the measure of God's love, period, measure of God. And it's one of the most recognizable, recognizable passages in all the Bible. But it's important to understand it in the context of this conversation with Nicodemus. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to propose three pillars to Christianity that come out of this passage that maybe you haven't... I think the third one, most of us don't relate. Okay? The first one is absolutely obvious. The first one's Jesus Christ. All right? That's the pillar of Christianity. It's not a doctrinal statement per se, but it's a belief in a person who is the second person of the Trinity, who is God incarnate, who has no equal, no peer when it, when it comes to, you know, belief in someone, okay? But that's, that's the absolute pillar. And sometimes we forget that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Secondly, God's love and grace. So vitally important. God's love and grace. The mission of God is predicated by love. That's John 3.16. Okay? That in, in the context of talking to Nicodemus and kind of squaring him around, it's saying, by the way, all this law stuff, all this stuff, you need to understand, even the law, um, I, I was an Old Testament professor for 27 years, right? The fastest way to fail in my class is to say the Old Testament is law, the New Testament is grace. You get fail right away. Because the Old Testament is just as much about grace and the giving of the law is just as much about grace than the New Testament, okay? Unfortunately, we don't always recognize grace even when it's slapping us in the face. Did I lose you? Grace is the theme throughout the entire Bible, but it's extra, you know, um, it's an extra focus in the New Testament through the person of Christ. Because now we have a, you know, a, a tangible representation of God, fully grace, fully love. All right? So, so important. Now, here's a third pillar that doesn't often get communicated, that comes right out of this passage, I think is vitally important, is that firsthand witness. Okay? Here's why Christianity is like, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but Jesus just said something that's pretty significant, right? He said, no one has come down from heaven. I have come down. No one has been to heaven and seen, you know, but I have come down from heaven, right? Jesus is a firsthand witness to the reality of the divine enablement, to heaven, to the spiritual world, to the divine necessity that God has given, all of those kinds of things. It's so vitally, vitally important that Jesus talks about being first-hand witness, okay? Uh, no one else in any religious context can claim this. Everyone else is like, I'm a prophet or I've communicated, I had this communicated from an angel, all of that kind of stuff. This is so vitally important in Christianity, that we have a first-hand witness in Jesus. Amen? Amen? Like, this is so dramatically different than any, anyone else, anywhere else, okay? If I'm going to lean, personally, myself, if I'm going to lean into faith, as I have, not to give you any doubt, 
who am I going to believe? One that's been to heaven and back or one that's only heard about it? Okay, I know that's, I know that's really kind of uh, strong right now. But there's something to this that Jesus himself is communicating to Nicodemus. It's very important. Okay? So let, let me finish up then. Here's the last part. John 3, 18 to 21. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And by the way, this is the interesting thing about the Gospel of John. Judgment happened when Jesus came to the earth. It's not an end time thing. Okay? Judgment happens right now. Belief and eternal life happens right now at the point of belief. Okay? That's the way that John communicates these things. Okay? Um, and the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light. For their actions were evil, and all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see they are doing what God wants. Okay? So this passage is kind of speaking to three types of religion as a warning against three types of religion. So hear me out. I've got another five minutes, and I think this is really important to go through, okay? Number one is no religion at all. No religion is a type of religion, okay? It has its own faith. It has its own belief system. It's rooted often in pride and arrogance. I know, I know that's, again, harsh statement. Remember I joked, uh, what was it, around Christmas time about people having an immaculate immaculate perception of themselves, okay? okay? That's immaculate perception of themselves. I call, I call people who see themselves as the center of the universe, I call that spiritual cannibalism. Oh, that's what I call it. I call it spiritual cannibalism because you feed on yourself, on your own power and glory, your own whatever, or somebody else's, maybe your spouse, all right? That's nothing more than spiritual cannibalism. You might not like that terminology, but you won't forget it. Okay? I, and I find, I find, by the way, deconstruction's not all bad. Can we just say that? There's some good things to deconstruction. But if deconstruction leads you to walking away from Jesus, you've just committed spiritual suicide. Spiritual cannibalism and spiritual suicide if you walk away from Jesus. Okay? That's, can we say ouch together? Ouch. Okay? I'm being very visual today. Okay? Secondly is self-righteous religion. Jesus had to deal with this a lot. Again, it's rooted in pride and arrogance. Um, you know, people say, hey, we are the only church that gets it right. Everyone else is uh, wrong, okay? If you, don't, if you don't do this version, do this worship, do this, wear this outfit, you know, like you, you name it, you name it, okay? There's a tendency to be self-righteous about how we do our faith, okay? Remember the bumper sticker? Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite? That's a self righteous statement okay <laughs> number three is transactional religion and transactional religion is you know I prayed to God he didn't give it to me I don't want God anymore okay I only worship God until he gives me what I want everything I want Right? It takes away the entire understanding of relational faith, takes away entirety of the sovereignty of God, takes away entirely um, that God probably got something better for you than you could ever imagine for yourself, all of that kind of stuff. And if we're, if we're not careful, and this is an easy drift, the, the, the two easy drifts where most 
people who've been Christian a long time is a self-righteous religion and a transactional religion. Those are the two big dangers. And if you look at the way that the whole conversation with Nicodemus is structured, it's all about transactional, it's all about self-righteousness. And in fact, Jesus, in dealing with the Pharisees, they were always all about self-righteousness. We are sons of Abraham and sons of Moses. We, you know, that whole, that whole bit, all right? So, let me, let me, let me just close with, with something that maybe I just want to remind you of. Many people think that the whole conversation with Nicodemus ends in John 3, and it doesn't. Nicodemus actually shows up two more times in the Gospel of John. In 750, he shows up defending Jesus when the Pharisees are kind of, you know, what are we going to do? And they start plotting against Jesus. And he kind of goes, oh, wait a minute, maybe. And they kind of, you know. But the last time he shows up is after Jesus has been crucified. And he goes with Joseph of Arimathea to claim the body. Now, many of you probably know that story, but the fact of the matter is for Nicodemus to expose himself at that particular time as a Pharisee was probably the worst and is the worst he could have possibly done for his career, for his standing, for his you know, livelihood, all of that kind of stuff. And it absolutely communicates that Jesus planted a seed in John 3 that fully blooms later on. That at the worst possible time to come out of the witness protection program, <laughs> Nicodemus shows up later on after the crucifixion. This is even before the resurrection. And Jesus planted an incredible seed because Jesus recognized what Nicodemus was hearing and gave him something to think about. That's how, that's what a difference it makes when we hear Jesus well. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the story of Nicodemus and just what we can learn from it. It's such a powerful story, and there's a lot of theology. But Lord, I, I pray this morning for anyone who is here, be it online or in person, who have not made a faith commitment, that have not recognized that the greatest expression of God's love to us is in the person of Jesus Christ sent him to die for us, sent to become our sacrifice, something that we could not have done for the salvation of the world. That degree of love is just unbelievable. And yet, through simple belief, we become beneficiaries of all that his sacrifice gives us. Salvation, redemption, a new relationship, a new heart, an eternity, just incredible blessings when we simply believe in what Jesus did. So, Lord, I, I pray for anyone who is listening to this that your spirit would speak to them now and have them open their heart to Jesus. And for believers this morning, those who have been believers a long time, Lord, may you guard their heart against self-righteous religion, a transactional religion that says, Lord, give me what I want or else. So, Lord, we just thank you, and we pray that in the days ahead, we would learn to hear you 
and to hear you well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand and join us for one final song of praise? you that you are the one who gives us life, that we can be born again and become a new creation in you, that through you we can, we can become your people and people who change the world and, and who can love people as they should be loved. Lord, help us to hear the words that we were just reading in your word. Help us to hear them as you spoke them, Jesus, long, long ago, and help us to ruminate on them, listen to them, and just just make them true to us. And Lord, I ask that you make us live in light of those truths this week and beyond, God. We love you and we thank you that you have loved us in this way, that we can believe in you. 
and that we can have eternal life. We love you so much for that, and we praise your name because of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.